decolonization in all that we do. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize some people who have passed away this week, people who are important members of our communities, um, who were fighters, who were organizers, who were musicians, who were historians. Um, I want to take a, a moment of silence to honor the memory of Randy Fonzio, Bob Rosen, and Ben Swanky. Thank you. So my name is Lisa Moore, and my role in this panel is to welcome you, which I have done, and also to give you a little bit of history, a little bit of context of what we are doing tonight. And, and really, for me, this panel is a dream come true, and it's also a first step, or it's a, a step in a process. Um, for me, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for us to be able to celebrate Rhizome's fifth anniversary by having a public discussion about how Rhizome is part of the network, how, how Rhizome is in and of itself a network, but it is deeply linked to other spaces that, are, that exist in support of social movements, both those that are currently in existence and others that, that came before us. Um, and I, I really can't think of a better way of celebrating our birthday than, than to acknowledge that, that we are part of something that is much bigger than us. Um, and just to, to give a little bit of background, when we started Rise Only five years ago, we wanted to start a space that would be directly in support of social movements. We wanted to create a space that would foster dialogues that couldn't happen in other places. Um, we wanted to raise up important voices that are rarely heard. We wanted to create a living room in, and a place that communities could come together that are often divided from each other geographically um, and by all of the different structures in our society that divide us rather than helping us find our commonalities. Um, we also wanted to create a, a space where we could together develop skills to organize, to resist, to build different ways of living and existing and celebrating and being together. So in that moment, and really ever since we've felt a deep connection to other spaces that are doing the same, um, we've, you know, we've been able to build connections with spaces that are represented on this panel, but also a lot of other spaces that are also vitally important in our communities. And I think some other spaces are, are present here tonight, or represented tonight, and we want to acknowledge them as well in a minute, once we learn who's, who's on our panel. Um, so we've drawn, we've drawn inspiration from these spaces, we've collaborated in some ways, we've shared ideas, we've supported each other's events, and now we really want to figure out how to strengthen those ties and, and what's the next step. How can we support each other's work better? Um, how can we acknowledge those ties? And we also want to figure out what we can learn from these other spaces. We know that there's a lot that we can learn that will help us live our own values better, live our own mission better, um, and figure out how, how we can strengthen each other's work. So I want to introduce also the Rise Home Movement Building Center. This panel is being hosted by the Rise Home Movement Building Center Coordinating Collective and 
four of the members, including myself, are present right now and are going to be leading this panel. Mia Amir, Denise Valle Cantos, Carlos Sayo. Um, others who are not present tonight are Cynthia Oka and Adriana Paz. And we as the, as the coordinating collective of the Rise Home Movement Building Center are figuring out how to take this space beyond being a venue. How can this space actually really provide training, skills training, skills sharing, so that all of our organizing can be stronger? Um, so that is something that we can tell you more about later, but the, the Movement Building Center is hosting this evening um, and, and really hoping to start a conversation that can continue well beyond today. So what we're hearing today is the beginning of something. As I said, this is in, in a large way, a part of our history as we've been moving towards this evening, but it's also a first step towards developing some new relationships and strengthening the ones we have. So I'm going to turn it over now to Mia and Denise, who are going to explain the panel and then moderate the panel, and then hopefully we can have some really good discussion later in the evening. Thank you all for being here. This is really exciting, and thank you to our panelists also for joining us. Um, so the way tonight's going to work is we will have our panelists speak. We've asked them all to respond to a different question that we tailored to the work that their space either is doing now or historically did. Um, and after that conversation takes place, we're going to have an open dialogue that takes place between all of us in the space. And the idea is that we've all got experiences and connections to radical spaces in the community and have a lot of really important ideas and reflections on the work that has taken place. And so it's a great opportunity for us to get to sit inside of that wisdom and be able to share. Um, so that's, that's the way it'll work. Um, each panelist is going to have 10 minutes total to introduce their space to you and also to address the question that they were assigned. Um, or introducing them not in order of importance, but in order of appearance. Um, we'll be speaking uh, Cecilia from the Calian Center, Linda from La Quena, Rain from, uh, Rin from Spartacus, uh, Rocio from the Organizing Center for Social and Economic Justice, and then Jasmine and Anna from the Occupy Vancouver. So we'll just get underway with introducing our first speaker. And I'm going to hand it over to Denise. So, oh, oh, sorry, and I forgot to ask a question. Um, we wanted to acknowledge all of the other spaces that are represented in the room that are not represented on the panel tonight. So I was just hoping anybody who's connected to or participating in another radical space in the community, if you could just raise your hand and shout out the name of that space, that would be awesome. Uh, I'm right, I have. People's Co-op Bookstore and the Drive do literary stuff, and I'm also with the Center for Social Education at 706 Park Drive. Okay, thank you. I said, yeah. I saw some more hands right here. Um, Purple Business Center. Thank you. Awesome. Urban Native Research Association. That there? About 300 miles up the Fraser River, uh, Spirit Dance Community, uh, Cooperative Community, we hold our mortgage with CCDC. So. And we bring vegetables and honey down there. Great, thank you. Uh, Fred Gallery and Vancouver Media Co-op. And I think 12th and Clark was another space that we wanted to make sure got mentioned as well as Dogwood was mentioned. And so, Collective House Network as well. Great. So, a plethora, an overwhelming plethora of radical spaces in this room tonight. And then we get over to Denise now. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. It's exciting to be here, so we're going to go straight into our panel. Um, first to speak is on behalf of the Kalyan Center. The Kalyan Center, um, from the word meaning freedom in Tagalog, Kalyan was started by 13 Filipino women who are mostly living caregivers. 
who combined their resources and bought a building in the downtown East Side. They converted the, into the Collian Center, which formed in 1996 and became Vancouver's first progressive Filipino Canadian community center to fight for genuine social justice and human rights by educating, organizing, and mobilizing around the issues of oppression, exploitation, racism, and other barriers. Collian Center also became a hub for organizing the Filipino community alongside other marginalized groups. So um, speaking on behalf of the Collian Center, it's Cecilia Dioxon. She's a community-based organizer, activist, and researcher. She's currently the executive director of the National Alliance of Philippine Women in Canada and the coordinator of the Capit Visa Community Center in Montreal. She was the founding chair of the Philippine Women Center, a founding me member of the Congress of Philippine Progressive Filipino Canadians, and an instrumental in founding the acquisition of the Kalyan Center of BC. <laughs> Center bought the center. 
Launching and uh, uh, it was attended by so many, like over 100 people. I know that I think that space can only hold about 80. But if you squeeze in, you can be like over 100. <laughs> Maybe 150. So we actually did that so many times. And uh, since then, um, we had so many workshops there. We developed activists in the community. That's many other activists. It was a hub um, used by so many um, groups in Vancouver. You want, also, you know, the ones who are also in the same situation as, as, as us, right? marginalized groups. Um, so the center uh, served so many women, um, young people, and even um, community to respond to their um, challenges. But in 1997, it became a real place for political activism. I don't know if you remember the, the, the Leader Summit, the APEC Leader Summit. The Philippine Center organized uh, the local APEC since 1985, we started a grassroots women discussion group and discussed about the new liberal agenda of globalization where uh, the leader summit was going to talk about the Asia-Pacific economic cooperation at the time. And uh, Bush was the president of the United States. Okay. Um, so of course, it was a very exciting time for the young activists from our community and also from other communities. But for us, uh, from the Filipino community, it was really um, wonderful because we had so many eager young people who wanted to be developed as activists. So Carlo was still in high school. <laughs> but we did so many workshops, and the place that we were training the activists was in that, that center. And in 1997, when we finally came, um, we had uh, over 70 volunteers to be able to hold that big conference, uh, very militant rounds. We thought that we then occupied the city of Vancouver at that time. The activists, they were so smart in seeing to it that we occupy the north-south, east-west streets of Vancouver and have our speakers spoke in that area. So we're able to hold the traffic for so many hours in Vancouver. And uh, the police, they were there. You know, gather, gathering like this, they're always, they're always there, right? They always listen to what we say. Um, you know, they're like us, they don't wear uniforms. We saw that during our uh, organizing, uh, you know, you know, they're always there. You know, we can see the, the difference you know, from an activist to about people who really just want to know who these people are, trying to, you know, wrap the boat. So, I think that was the most important event um, that we had at the Playa And uh, yeah, so right now we're in a big challenge because um, after over 15 years, uh, we needed repairs um, at the center. And uh, it's also the time when we don't have a lot of, you know, um, funding. Uh, and so uh, the center right now, it's still there, we're not, we're not uh, able to use it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of Filipino activists are also going to other spaces right now to hold their events. Uh, we hope that um, in the near future we'll be able to come together and really decide what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do with the day. We still have a lot of vision and 
you know, that uh, they can get the end of the community. So we hope that, uh, yeah, we'll be able to, uh, to use the center again and, uh, and you know, be, and have more fun for the next generations to come. Thank you, Cecilia. Our next speaker is Linda, who is representing La Quena. So Linda was one of the founders of La Quena. She worked at the Carnegie setting up and organizing the Learning Center, and she worked on community boards. And presently, she's involved in the Council of Seniors. She's helped organize events throughout the Sunshine Coast. Labor Council, particularly International Women's Day and the December 6th commemoration. And for those who are unfamiliar with what Latina was, Latina was a project of the Canadian Latin American Cultural Society and thrived on commercial drive for 18 years. It was a free speech, it was a free space for social, educational, and cultural events, and was also used for organizing, holding meetings, and benefits. Solidarity with people struggling against poverty and oppression was the main theme. And initially the focus was on people of Chile and money raised helped organizations that fought against the most brutal dictatorship. La Quena expanded over time to include solidarity with environmentalism, First Nations, women, labor and union, farm workers, African National Congress, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Philippines, Cuba, Burma, Argentina, Mexico, and Ireland. And um, on a personal note, looking as one of the first spaces that I act, uh, accessed as a very young activist and was a very important space in my generation. So uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. And Linda, thank you. Oh, oh, and the question that Linda is dealing with, sorry, is how does having a space impact the morale, heart, and groundedness of a movement? How are mourning, struggle, celebration, and education made more possible when we have a place to meet. Can people hear the bell? I don't think I need to say anything more to all of a I think um, I'm going to sort of do a roundabout answer to this question, but I, I'm, my son has told me that I'm not to be like all the lefties that he knows and talk on and on and on, so I have to do this really quickly, she said. Talk fast, it's going to quit. So I'll try to do that. Maybe I'll do it in five minutes. So I'll help um, when we started with Dana, we this was in 1981, so 30 years ago. Um, most many of you weren't born yet. Um, I always look and think about that. Um, there was a small group of us, five or six of us, uh, who had been involved in solidarity work with um, the Chileans. And um, probably you know that Chile was under a, a dictatorship since 1973. Um, so there was a small group of Chileans and Canadians who had been involved for, for quite a while who decided that we wanted to have a space where we could meet regularly, uh, where we could put on our events, where we could listen to our music, where we could do educational. Um, and so that's what we did. We spent a year fundraising. Uh, we, needed, we, had, we needed, at that time, that was three years and over $5,000 to open the doors. Um, we did that fundraising in a year. We did a lot of the planning. And we secured, by a lot of luck as well, a location on commercial drive. And um, it was, I always laughingly say, it was our socialist landlord. He was a, a member of the NDP and MLA, and uh, he owned the building. And so he gave it to us for a lot of bad price. But I know that when we closed in uh, the 90s, uh, we were paying over $2,000 a month for the rent. Uh, quite a bit of money. We spent um, about three, two, two, three months renovating, and we renovated with volunteers. We had over 100 people uh, volunteer. They built everything. Uh, oh, we had to buy a few things like a dishwasher and a cappuccino machine. 
But, um, but essentially, all the renovation was done by volunteers. We opened in October of 1982. Uh, we were open from 10 in the morning to 11 at night. I don't know what the hours of guards on are. But uh, we were open those, that number of hours. We ran, we had one uh, volunteer coordinator. We, we essentially held the whole place together. Uh, and the rest of it was done with volunteer work. So that is something that maybe is different than here. Um, we were able to do that at the time. Um, you know, it was a lot easier to get. And um, people were able to work part-time and volunteer their time. Lots of people put in hours and hours. Over the years, with the came uh, we just I just did an article for um, this book called, what is this from Grandview Woodland? I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's the 125-year anniversary of Vancouver, and this is um, a book on stories from, from Commercial Drive and Grandview Woodland. And I did an article on uh, the King of Floyd, so why did I tell you that? I'm not sure. Um, we, <laughs> so I counted up. We had at least a thousand volunteers, at least a thousand volunteers over the years. So it was a tremendous. Um, and what's important about that seems to me is that having that number of volunteers and training volunteers all the time is that we were continually bringing new people into the King. So, um, and there were new issues. We started off being very focused on uh, Canada, Latin America, and the kind of solidarity work we could do. Uh, over time, we ended up doing uh, South African solidarity, Irish solidarity, um, uh, Middle Eastern solidarity, all over Latin America, North American First Nation solidarity. We did, we did everything, and partly, and we were able to bring in more people, I, and I'm not sure which is kind of chicken and egg, whether we brought in the people to work in the can as volunteers, and then they brought their organizations with them, or they, they, they contacted the organizations to come in to use the can, or whether the organization used the can, and then people said, you know what, I want to work with you. And so people, people came and worked. Um, so we did that. We had all kinds of art on the wall, much like you see here. It's really nice to see this. Uh, we had music. We had music, fantastic music from everywhere. And um, we held the educations. We did slideshows. We did movies. We also did something for the community to develop itself, which was to have these, the open stage nights where people would get up and either read poetry, their own poetry, or play music, or sing, or whatever, whatever they wanted to do. Um, we, I was talking to one of the people, we can't do anything about, you know, about having to consult with everybody all the time. So I was talking to somebody last night about the can I did. I've done my five minutes, I'll have to tell my son. Um, <laughs> so I was talking about it and she said, you know, I wasn't on the planning committee or anything, but I was given a night and my job was to program for that night. So different people were given different nights and they would program for those nights. And, uh, and she did the open, the open mic, and uh, so that, that was quite, or the open stage was quite, uh, that was quite helpful. Um, different groups did different kinds of things. Then the other thing that happened, or two other things I'll tell you quickly, one was the fiestas. We held fiestas uh, in, the, in Grandview Park in the summer, um, in July. It was a big celebration around the Nicaraguan Revolution, the Cuban Revolution was always around that time. And we um, piggybacked on the folk festival. So we got a lot of the singers at that time, there were some political singers uh, at the folk festival, and they came and, and they uh, performed there. And then they performed at Lakina. So that was really, that was a great kind of community event, and everybody was welcome. Um, and then um, one other thing is that we did, we did expansion into the community in which we had groups come and use Lakina for educationals or um, uh, meetings or AGMs that would have a closed meeting. Um, and we would rent the space. And we rented it, um, again, we're, we weren't very good business people, so we rented it for 10% uh, of whatever they took in at the door. 
So, you know, um, and then they got the rest of it. Because they were usually fundraising. Like, everybody was in the same boat when we had the money. So um, we, we were able to to you to um, bring in lots of groups. And I'll just mention a, a couple of them, and then I'll quit. Uh, West Coast Mental Health, uh, Midwife Task Force, Environmental Crossroads, Aguilary Women's Magazine, Kinesis Environmental Emergency Response Team, Prison Justice Day, Little Sisters Poetry Reading, it just goes on. Uh, Downtown Eastside Poets, Veteran Environmentally Sound Transportation, which just goes on and on and on. So we were able to reach out and bring in more people to the, the place. So the space allowed us um, um, tremendous ability to meet, to plan, to celebrate, to mourn. I know that when one of our, our compañeros died, everybody that the night that we heard of his death, everybody went to the family to be there, to be able to, to do that. Um, so those were the kinds of things that the compañeros allowed us to do. challenges and lessons that come out of having the space. Um, I just want to start by saying how honored I am to be on a panel with such incredible organizers. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Spartacus has been around longer than I've been alive. Um, so it's a lot for me to talk about Spartacus. Um, I've been lucky enough to get to interview some folks that have been involved in Spartacus since the very beginning, and so I have a, a bit of a sense of kind of the history of the store, so I'll talk about that a little bit. And um, I've been involved in the store for going on six years now, so that's mostly what I have experience of, and I'll, I'll speak mostly to that. Um, so Spartacus started uh, originally as a group of people that wanted to get radical literature that they couldn't get anywhere else. Um, and originally, some of the folks that started the store, um, Roger Perkins was one of the gentlemen who was the, kind of one of the driving forces behind it. And um, Linda knows as much about this as I do. <laughs> um, who were, happened to work at the SFU bookstore, and so had a connection there to be able to order, order books and, and know what was coming out, but it was stuff that the bookstore wouldn't carry. Um, and so started out as just book tables up at SFU. You could get a table for free and sell books, and that was the way that they um, made enough money to start the store. Um, and uh, I had a chance to sit down with Roger and interview him about the kind of those first few years of the store, and he told me that at that time there were lots of you know this this was a time when printed books at a bookstore was how you got information and how information was traded between movements and. There were many different radical bookstores, sort of each different kind of faction had their own little space and their own little bookstore, and they were all down in that area. The, the store was uh, on the 100 block of West Hastings first for a few years, and then it moved to 311 uh, West Hastings and stayed there for many, many years until that location burned down in 2004. Um, so I, I made some notes for myself so that I try to stay in order. Um, 
So by having the book table and slowly making enough money after a couple of years, they were able to rent a space and the store opened in 1973. And um, one of the first events that happened in the store um, was actually on the 10th of September, 1973, um, which was one of the people who was involved in the collective had just come back from traveling in Chile and gave an update about the socialist revolution that had happened and how exciting it was, what was going on there, and how powerful it was. And someone said, do you think it's going to last? And he said, yes, I do. Um, and that was the 10th of September, 1973. Of course, we all know what happened back the 11th of September, 1973, which was the previous act to Michelle. And so that was it interesting connection and those are the kind of things that happened and still happen in our store um, there was um, an event not too long ago where someone had just returned from Egypt and gave a first-hand report of what they had seen of the revolution in Egypt and so that's kind of what the store has always been about is people wanting access to information that they can't get anywhere else um, and it started to be, once there was an actual store, as well as books, it started to be a meeting space, a gathering space, and it still is that today. Um, one of the, so I'm finding this to be incredibly awkward at this angle, so. Um, one of the stories that I really like about something that's powerful about the store that I think still holds true today is that um, one of the folks who was involved in the store in the 70s told me that he came into the store one day to read a newspaper and chill out, and he saw that the two people that were working the counter that day were a Maoist and a Trotskyite that had been shouting at each other across a meeting the night before, and just were fundamentally had totally opposite visions of what the radical world they wanted to live in looked like. Um, but here they were sharing a shift in the store and, you know, joking and hanging out, and that I think is what's really powerful about Spartacus as a space, is that people that have fundamental disagreements about what the world they want to live in looks like can share the common ground of wanting a space where those conversations can happen. Um, and I think that's one of the things that remains really powerful about the story because it's about ideas, you know? Um, so the store began to kind of morph a little bit from being more of a socialist focus, which is how it began. Um, in the 80s, as the anarchist info shop movement became really powerful, it morphed into being more of an anarchist space, um, connected through the sort of loose network of anarchist book fairs and zine fairs and the info shop network sort of around the continent and around the world. And it became more kind of a punk bookstore, an anarchist info shop style DIY space, um, place for meetings and organizing and workshops and sign making. Um, and then in 2004, the fire happened. Um, and of course, you know, the store didn't have insurance. We didn't have anything. Um, the store burnt to the ground completely. Everything gone. All the books, all the posters, everything gone. And one of the things that I think is, keeps me so inspired to be involved in Spartacus is that the only reason that the store came back is because the community came out of the woodwork to say, we can't live in Vancouver if there's no Spartacus. Where will we meet? Where will we get books? Where will we find that? Like, what will we do? And the community banded together and brought the store back to life. It was incredible. We had nothing. The only thing that still exists from the old store is one poster that, that hangs in our bathroom. And it's the only thing that still exists from the store. And the only reason it exists is because someone had taken it home the night. And it just happened to not be in the store the night of fire. Um, and so the store was closed for a year and a half after the fire and reopened again in mid-2005. And we were in a space that was next door to where the old store had been. Um, and that was about the time that I came on board with Spartacus. And so my understanding of the store has been in the context since that time of the gentrification of the downtown east side. Um, so we were in that space for a year, about a year and a half. And just in that year and a half, as we were trying to come back from the store having burned down, uh, we got priced out of the neighborhood where we had been since the 70s. Um, Spartacus is now at 684 East Hastings, which is Hastings and Heatley. And I think it's really telling that a space that only managed to come back from the fire because of what it means to the community has been pushed out 
by the increasing prices and the speculation and everything, the whole complex of things that are happening to gentrify the downtown east side. And I think that that makes the openness of the space so important. I mean, it's a bookstore. That's what keeps the lights on and keeps us buying more books. Um, we have no staff. We're all run by volunteers. So everything that you pay for a book just goes into keeping the lights on, paying the bills, and buying more books. Um, but what's really important about the space is how open it is. And as public space vanishes in the increasing commodification and gentrification of the neighborhood, a space where you can go all day and just lay on the couch and read a book and not get hassled to buy something becomes more and more important. Um, and the, the conversations that happen and the people that meet each other just because it's a space where you can go um, and not have to justify your existence by buying stuff is super important. Um, yeah, people, we have um, computers in the store. People come to use our computers. Like, people make resumes. People write letters to their family. People check their email and do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. You know, you don't have to sign in at the door. You don't have to ID. You don't have to prove that you have a caseworker or justify your, your right to be there in the space using the resources that we have. Um, and I think that's what makes it really unique. Um, so in terms of challenges and benefits, the question I'm supposed to address, um, what's really interesting about it to me is that our challenges are just in the day-to-day -day things, like cleaning up the clutter and answering the mail and, you know, paying the bills and keeping the lights on. And, like, it's really a space where we have to figure out how we're going to live our radical politics in our day-to-day -day lives and the individual choices that we make. Um, we're a collective of anywhere from 20 to 40 people. We make all of our decisions by consensus. Um, and that means that we, we have to figure out how to do things like in a neighborhood where the disparity is increasing really quickly, how do we deal with the fact that our store's been held up at knife point? You know, if we're a collective of people that doesn't agree with the criminal law system that we have and doesn't think that it in any way keeps anyone safe to engage with that, what do we do when our store gets wrong? How do we deal with that, you know? Um, how do we engage from, you know, the radical vision that we have for the world, and then the fact that we have to pay our rent at the end of the month? How do we do that? Um, and so our challenges are very day-to-day, -day, and for me, the benefit of that, and that because we have a space that we have to keep clean and keep open and keep warm and fix stuff when it breaks and all that kind of stuff, because they're really concrete, real, day-to-day, -day, small challenges, it allows us to really integrate, like, what do I actually believe about my radical vision for the world? Like, and because we do that on a really personal, really real, concrete level, we build our skills in such a powerful way. And the thing that I love the most about it is that um, when people say to me, well, you know, anarchy would never work. That's impossible. I say, have you been as far as books? <laughs> And that's what I think is so powerful about it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rocio from the Organizing Center. So Rocio, um, in 2003, participated in the Bus Riders Union Fair Strike, and soon after that became a member of the Bus Riders Union core and an on-the-bus direct contact organizer. In 2005, she was part of the core that decided to launch a broader forum for left strategizing and organizing, the Organizing Center for Social and Economic Justice. Now, after five years of organizing out of the OC, she focuses not only with the OC Collective, but is also launching a new affiliated organization, Workers Across Borders, which was inspired by the class struggle of 18 undocumented workers demanding their labor rights in fighting wage theft in Vancouver. The Organizing Center itself is an alliance of grassroots organizations and projects with a shared strategy for fighting for social and economic justice a collective of organizers who work with affiliated organizations and projects. They are a democratic collective with a Marxist, anti-racist, and anti-sexist analysis. A community of people struggling for social and economic justice, celebrating their resistance to oppression and exploitation, and building new relationships based on equality, solidarity, and social justice. Rocio. And our question, I keep forgetting, the question that she's dealing with 
is how have you been able to use your space to link communities and link struggles? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me on the panel. I'm glad to be here. Um, so I'm going not to repeat what Mia gave in the intro, but maybe tell um, a story of uh, the work that we do out of the OC. And uh, the example I'm going to use is my own example with uh, Workers Across Borders, which is a worker-led organization that launched last year after um, a wage theft uh, struggle with 18 undocumented workers. Uh, so how we connected with these 18 workers, um, they came to us because of the work that we're doing um, as an organizing center. Um, I'll elaborate on what other work we do later after my example. But, um, so we connected with this group of workers who got ripped off, who were paid for the all their work they did for, I don't know, how many months and long hours of work. Um, they came to us seeking support, and the first thing that we thought to do was to help them with the, the employment standard branch um, process. So kind of giving them an education around what, how do you file a complaint? Are you allowed to file a complaint as a, an undocumented worker? Um, and then after that, have discussions around, well, why did it happen? Um, have meetings together, give, like giving them support um, and talking about the experience of working long hours for someone who was promising papers and getting paid and all that. So from that experience, we built a, a really tight-knit group that decided um, that we needed to take action around this horrific um, experience. And take this experience, uh, take this um, wage back to the streets. So we, um, with the workers, decided we were going to do a direct confrontation, um, not a direct confrontation, but a, um, a public uh, confrontation with the, uh, at the work site. So we mobilized um, the workers, uh, our friends. Uh, other members from the other affiliated um, groups at the OC, um, people from the community that support the work at the OC to come out to this mobilization. And we had banners, we had chanting to um, expose the, the theft of, 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 of money of hardworking people and um, expose um, the, the exploitation that happens in Vancouver. So um, we did that. Um, after that, we just continued working hard to engage with Employment Standard Branch by sending letters, sending emails, going to the office, making sure that they were doing their job. But um, that experience, of course, with the bureaucratic process is always very lengthy. And not after two years, we got a, a determination, um, a positive determination. They didn't get all the money they were owed, but they did get some of the money back. And uh, so we're in that process right now. But from that experience, we decided that we needed to launch uh, a group that supported workers, and not just undocumented workers, but ununionized workers in Vancouver. Um, so since that experience, we've helped about five different cases, and, and we've used different strategies where we've encouraged um, um, workers to confront their boss before going to the Employment Standard Branch. And in each case, we've won money back pretty fast. So that's something very positive. So that's it. The kind of work we we are doing at the OC. It's 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 work that's linked to struggle, struggle of working class people. So um, uh, yeah, we organizers, our members are envisioning a, a world that, that ends, that there's no exploitation. Um, I, I can elaborate on that, but I only have five minutes. <laughs> but uh, we, we also, yeah, and uh, at the OC, we, we're, we're trying to put forth a strategy to um, confront and, and deal with, with the, the issues that arise in our communities. And, and uh, the OC offers training and it offers um, support and all sorts of things that I'll elaborate later in the question. <laughs> so I was given the question, um, let me repeat so I can know where I'm at here. 
So how have you been able to use your space to link communities and link struggles? Um, at first, when I read that question, I was like, whoa, the OC, I've never thought about it in, in that concept of space. The OC, for me, is uh, a grassroots organization that's trying to build uh, a movement and provide um, ideological space um, through developing and communicating social change strategy, building our leadership skills, uh, supporting each other, and struggling, well, and, and struggling together to understand um, oppression and exploitation. Uh, and also um, taking risks to figure out, uh, and taking risks and doing different things to, to make social change happen. So that's one way we use our space. Um, also, uh, the space, well, the OC, I don't know, I don't, can't call it the space because the OC is the OC. <laughs> I'm having a hard time calling it a space because the, it goes beyond that physical space. Like the OC isn't just a storefront where people you know, meet. The OC is, um, is in the streets, it's in the communities. Like for example, the BRU was one of the first organizations that, well, the BRU inspired um, the idea of the OC and what the BRU occupied was the buses. We would go on the buses and talk to people and organize bus riders out of the buses to fight for fight against the privatization of public transportation. Um, and so a lot of these um, different projects that are coming out of the OC now are in that similar idea. We are trying to use those lessons that we got from the BRU, from a one issue based um, uh, organization, and expand our work to different areas. So now it, the OSC has become like a, an umbrella uh, uh, where a group of organizers, a group of projects, a group of organizations with a common strategy, but we use different areas that we're, we're organizing in different areas. So for example, we have the APH, the Alliance for People's Health that are organizing around health. They have a group that's, that, um, I don't, I'm sorry about the details, but they, the Community Health Workers is an important group that's just started this year, or last year. Okay. Um, also, we have the, the Workers Across Borders and FACTS, which is uh, um, a group that was working for uh, food justice. Um, and then in terms of trying to keep the space open, um, we've been really committed to uh, uh, increasing our capacity of, um, of uh, grassroots funding. Um, but. It, it's really hard when you're focusing so much on, on mass organizing and direct contact organizing that uh, what how we fund the space is really a personal commitment of each and every one of our members. So we all give a bit of our income to keep that space open. So, but um, that's where the, a challenge is for us because in order to keep uh, giving money and we have to all work and organize at the same time so that becomes that's where we're in a situation where the OC isn't open every day so but um, they, thanks to all the volunteer work and the commitment from the members that we are able to do events such as like community, uh, community cinema dinners um, we also lend out the space to different communities that don't have a meeting space, and we've we've had like groups like the Iran Solidarity use our space, who still hold classes, English classes for um, farm workers, um, and what else can I say about our space? And BIAC who meets uh, at, at OC, and so connecting with other groups, doing stuff around struggling around different. Um, yeah, different issues were connected to those struggles. Not just locally, not just what the OC does, but also internationally with groups that are doing solidarity work. And uh, yeah, that's the final topic. Thanks. Thank you, Rocio. So um, I also want to um, also acknowledge that Jean Swanson Carnegie from the Carnegie Center was supposed to speak.
but unfortunately she's, she's uh, not feeling well, so she's unable to speak. There's a bit of a bio in, um, in the little uh, pamphlets up front if you have uh, yeah, the turn of the Carnegie Center. Um, so next up, and the last speakers are from the unoccupied Vancouver. Um, we have Jasmine um, Rizaki. Um, is a social activist whose work has appeared in Ravel and this magazine. She's involved in Students for a Democratic Society and is currently active in the occupied, unoccupied Vancouver, um, whatever the term has been floating around. Um, she volunteers at the Downtown Eastside Women's Center and lives on Coast Salish territory. Also, we have Anna Sewell. She is Métis um, of the Creek Ojibwe. Sorry. <laughs> Ojibwe and Iroquois First Nations and French, Celtic, and Dutch settler heritage. A queer femme, two spirit, um, C gendered activist. Hey. Says, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, performer, facilitator, community developer, and indigenizer, mostly able bodied of the working poverty class groups. Anna is a visitor of the Coast Salish Territory. She has been actively participating in healing and decolonizing communities, social movements, and spaces for nearly two decades. While she represents only herself, she's committed to indigenous solidarity within the unoccupied movement and creating safer spaces for women, people of color, queer and trans folk, people with disabilities, fat folks, elders and teens, and a myriad of other folks. And unoccupied Vancouver is occurring on already occupied indigenous lands, and we will refer to it as unoccupied Vancouver here. The movement is symbolic of a mass awakening to social and environmental problems that marginalized groups have been raising up uh, for hundreds of years. The statement of unity reflects this. Currently, unoccupied Vancouver is nomadic because of active attempts by the city and provincial governments and their agents to shut them down and criminalize the activities which include providing free health care, free education, free food, free shelter, free access to public voice, and consensus-based decision-making to all humans. <laughs> unoccupied is larger than the space we inhabit, as it is an idea that fills our living rooms, kitchen tables, workplaces, shopping malls, government offices, minds, hearts, and ideals with possibilities for a better world. And the question is... Um, what does it mean to reclaim, but not occupy, reoccupy, recolonize space? <laughs> so before we um, address that question, um, me and Anna would like to acknowledge that although we have um, been actively involved in several committees, general assemblies, actions and events out of respect for the lateral leadership and collective nature of the unoccupied movement, we represent only ourselves as participants of the movement and countless voices are not represented here tonight. How's it going? So we've been sitting for a long time, and because Unoccupy is an interactive, participatory movement, I would like to invite you to play a quick game as part of our panel topic. Would you be willing to do that? It's more like a, it's more like a warm up than a game. Okay. It's just to get us out of our heads and into our bodies. So everybody, if you can, take one arm or a limb or your nose or whatever, one arm, and make an X. And the other arm or a limb or a nose or whatever you can, and make an O. O. <laughs> and one hand and write your first name if you can. And one leg and write your last name if you can. And then at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So if you agree with anything that we're saying, you can go like this. And if you disagree with anything that we're saying, you can go like this. But don't do it too vigorously. <laughs> so um, the reason we wanted to share that with you is because 
The Occupy movement, or the Unoccupy movement as we're referring to it, belongs to everyone in the way that you want to inhabit it, and we feel humble to be here representing ourselves, but as participants of this huge movement that's happening all over the, the world. And also, I really want to acknowledge everybody that's gone before in the panel so far, and our elders who have paved the way, so thank you so much. Um, I would like to share a quick story about my experience within the movement. My first time at an event was the first day, the first big event after the pre-occupied meeting. I wasn't there. And I saw the speakers and I noticed there was a lot of white, cisgendered men talking. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of women, people of color, people with disabilities and um, other marginalized groups, but there was just not a lot of representation. And I was talking to some of my friends who are people of color, who are women, who are queer, and we were feeling like, this, this isn't exactly the movement that we want to be part of. First Nations territory wasn't being acknowledged. There was, there was a few things we were feeling like, this, this isn't working. And a lot of my friends opted out of the movement because they just didn't feel comfortable. And I, I asked myself, I was like, okay, I, I feel like this movement is massive and has the potential to reach a lot, a lot of people. And do I want to be involved, even though it's not looking the way that I wish it would yet? Or do I want to be involved and make it look the way <laughs> that I wish it would? And so I checked in with myself and I decided to get involved even though I feel uncomfortable with the fact that it's called Occupy, because we're already on Occupy land, um, and there's so many things that I felt uncomfortable about. Um, but that's the beauty of this movement. The beauty of this movement is that we are defining it. We get to define it. We're babies. It's been, you know, this is, this is the first time in the history of the world, the world, that a movement can happen through technology on this level it, it blows my mind, actually. And we've never done anything like this before. We've done things that have led up to this. But this is the first time this has ever happened. And, um, and so I feel like one of the things that really this movement has to offer us is we get to have self-determination of roles. We get to create together. We get to create food together. We get to... Um, create the space together and of course there's conflict especially in such a baby movement but that conflict helps us to um, bond if we can get through it and to grow roots and to become stronger and to understand each other and so as an indigenous woman Métis um, I feel like what I have to offer is I'm both a settler heritage and indigenous heritage. And so I have this opportunity to help people to understand from all the different sides um, how colonization is underneath everything we're trying to change. Everything. And how it's all about colonization. So, I mean, everything. <laughs> it's all about colonization. So, um, we created a, a committee called the Indigenous Solidarity Committee, and it's, thank you, it's really, um, it's feeling really successful. We have a couple of amazing elders who open the space every every meeting with, um, with a prayer, and we do um, a talking circle, and we create the vision that we want for the movement. And Jasmine's part of this committee with me, so I'm gonna pass it over to Jasmine. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think everyone here is learning a lot about uh, Vancouver's really rich and radical history. And I wish we had more events like this where people from different generations and different communities come together and share their narratives. Because as a younger social movement, I feel like we should really align ourselves with you and learn from, from you. And um, so it means a lot, and we really appreciate, really appreciate it. And I think there is a lot for us to learn. Um, so yeah, I, 
I think both Anna and me, from the start, and I think a lot of us felt uncomfortable with the term Occupy because it does have um, a certain connotation which is problematic. Um, and we've, we've tried, with, as part of the Indigenous Solidarity Committee, to draw attention to that problematic language of occupation and, and draw attention to the fact that it's still in some ways um, the language of the colonizer that's being reproduced and that it's, the colonialist mentality is still present. Um, and, I mean, our intent as a movement isn't to occupy space to further perpetuate colonialism, but to occupy space to draw attention to issues like colonialism, um, the legacy of colon colonialism, the fact that you know, indigenous people are disproportionately poor um, or imprisoned, and that the colonial policies and mentalities um, are still taking place and are the issue. And, and so in some ways that it's the underlying issue um, that should be acknowledged, but it also this movement isn't a single issue movement, so it's about also respecting the fact that there are all sorts of issues that need to be addressed. And you know, I mean, ideally the tactic of occupation is applied uh, when a school or a neighborhood house is shut down due to budget cuts, or if someone is evicted from their home due to, you know, predatory banking practices, or a factory is closed due to outsourcing, you know, et cetera. And you go back and you occupy that space, and you assert your power as a collective, um, and get the services running up again using your own labor or whatever. Or you, you go back and you occupy your home. <laughs> And so, I mean, it's, it's like in that documentary, um, The Take with the Lily Clyde and Lewis. And so that, that type of occupation is a really powerful kind. Um, and so it, it is a tactic, and we should acknowledge the power of that tactic. Um, uh, right now, we're sort of, uh, because of the actions of the state, we have been forced into hibernation, and the winter time is also co coming up, so we are kind of hibernating. But it would, I mean, this is sort of a call out now, since there's so many people and so many people here. We are looking for social space out of which to organize in. Because we would like to maintain our infrastructure and still draw attention to all of the issues which exist. So if we align ourselves together and make those connections, we're so much more powerful because this movement belongs to everyone. And um, yeah. Thank you. time for all of our speakers. So what we've got now are four questions that the um, RMBC Coordinating Collective wrote in preparation for tonight's event. And uh, we want to address those um, as a community. And so we're going to encourage a dialogue between all of us in response to those questions. Three of them are actually on the front of the program if you've got one. And we'll be dealing with them in order, but there will be an extra question between the second and third that we're adding to tonight. That was supposed to be Jean Swanson's question, um, but because she wasn't able to make it here, we thought we would throw it out to the community present to, to get some ideas. We're gonna try to give about five minutes of discussion to each question so that this isn't like a protracted evening. Um, so I'm just going to ask people to really pay attention that as they're responding, um, really to pay attention to how much space we're taking up and to make sure that our comments are uh, really pithy and not repeating what other folks have said. And before we start, I'm going to encourage everybody who wants to, to just get up and have a stretch because we have been sitting and listening for a long time. So if you want to get up and move around for one sec. Um, yeah, and then and then we'll invite you to sit right back down once you're done doing that. <laughs> Thank you. 